And so one of the things that we've been working on is, well, we had about the same time an idea where, so we worked with uh, David Serrano and his group at the University of Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid, in España, where they were, we were controlling crystallization by forming tiny nanocrystals of ZSM-5 around a passivating agent which prevented their growth into much larger crystals and then achieved that in a paper which published the same year as, Pro as Professor Ryong Ryu at, the, at KAIST in South Korea published a paper where he took the zeolite nanocrystals and could form them in sheets which, prevent, which provi provided a zeolitic region and an open pore which was a mice from a mice cell which provided also large pores. So these both have the attributes of a mesostructured zeolite. A zeolite because it has the crystalline identity of one of these structures in the framework, but mesostructured because it's templated along a surfactant. And this provides both the high catalytic activity and the high mass transport. And this is really interesting from the combination of catalysis and being able to use now large molecules. And so just to show you the advantage, this is from the paper we had um, uh, with uh, the, the Spanish group, is we take these nanocrystals and then we have a structured directing agent and then we passivate them with a surface silylizing agent, which they basically passivates the surface, allows them to aggregate partly, but then prevents them from completely forming crystals. So they form small nanocrystallites where they have a small, a large exterior surface and what you can see already is by comparing this for the cracking, that is the decomposition of low density polyethylene. This would be for a recycling of polymers. Molecular weight of about 400,000 grams per mole over a zeolite to catalyst. The, the normal conventional ZSM5 converts this only 3%, very, very small. It, can, it breaks it to these you know, very small molecules on the, on the surface of what are large crystallites. By comparison, the mesoporous ZSM5 has a, almost a 90% conversion. And so this is because of the high surface area. And we get more in the area of the gasoline areas. So this is the kind of benefit that you get for being able to now take polymers and use them for things that were previously used only for natural gas. And as a chemical engineer, this is, I would say, is a breakthrough. And you see the difference between a normal, these are much larger particles, and these small nanocrystals, which are tiny and which allow much better access. Now, I think this is actually quite general, but what happened, what, it's not as beautiful as the work of the, Span of the Korean group, where, in fact, we worked with them together on this because we were working on using these mesoporous zeolites where you can get now, this is zeolite beta, but you have a molecules that could never fit into these tiny zeolite pores. But now, in the mesostructured zeolite, you see you get high conversions of these for Friedel-Crafts alkylation and Friedel-Crafts acylation of these large molecules of 82% and 52% conversion compared to those which would be either MCM41 or bulk zeolite beta, these are different types of zeolites, where you have essentially negligible conversion. So from a catalyst point of view, these combine the best of both by doing things that neither one of the individual conventional materials could do. And I want to talk to you, so I think this now is really at a point where it can be used. And I'm going to, but now I'm going to talk about some of the science behind this because the question is, I would ask, is how do these materials form? And so we've been, what I'm gonna talk about now is something that's not yet published, but which I think is much more geared towards understanding how and why these materials form. Because if we understand how they form, then we can use these for others, including compositions, maybe titania, maybe, maybe other organic molecules, where the similar type of processes are present. And so what this involves is a understanding how self-assembly of a surfactant can be combined with crystallization of the inorganic oxide. Now this is not easy. It took 20 or 25 years before people figured out how to do it, despite the huge incentive to try to do this. And that's because what you typically have to combine is a structure directing organocation. In this case, it's a quaternary ammonium group, which is, this is a um, tetrapropyl ammonium, which is the Organic cation, which is the structure directing agent for the, for the crystallization of bulk ZSM5. This, when crystallization occurs, the energetics of this are very strong. Self-assembly, van der Waals interactions, very weak. 
And so what, the cre what we had done is we'd worked in this area of, of surfactant making layered silicates for some time. We had a paper in the early 2000s and soon thereafter in 2004, a follow-on, where we were using surfactants, a quaternary ammonium, to form these layered silicates, which is actually going to be the topic of my talk at the ISMAR meeting in Rio de Janeiro next week, because we figured out how to get the structure of this without having a, a, any a, needing to use X-ray diffraction in a substantial way. So we're going to take these layered silicates, and it, there's going to be some very surprising, inter interesting things that happen with these layered silicates, um, where we now combine this structure of the, the surfactant self-assembly with the crystallization here, which are going to appear in our use of these mesostructured zeolites. So in these, what are similar is they form a, they have a surfactant, and then they have a structure directing agent of the zeolite. But unlike the, the Spanish approach, what, we are, what, what the Korean group did is they synthesized, and for the organic chemist here, synthesized surfactants, very special surfactants with a long alkyl chain, and the structure directing groups built in to an extended head group, like a Gemini surfactant. So these are complicated surfactants. They have a mesostructure directing alkyl hydrophobic tail and a zeolite directing crystallizing region which are going to be responsible for nucleating the, the crystalline zeolites in a way which will form structures that are layered and actually very similar to the ones I talked about before. It actually is, and I'll, already, I'll say in advance now that we know these things, it's not surprising because if you just cut at this place right here, this long alkyl chain and this quaternary ammonium head group looks very similar to the surfactant that we did for ours. The difference is that these silicate sheets are only one nanometer thick. They're two silicate, two silicate tetrahedra thick. Whereas, and therefore these are mechanically fragile. Whereas these, because they have multiple head groups, they have multiple, more two to six, they form these now structures which crystallize thicker sheets, and these things are about two to three times, and these now are mechanically robust and provide the ability to form this structurally stable mesostructured zeolites. So our objective now is to understand, for the rest of the talk, my, the first part, how to understand and control crystallization that occurs simultaneously with surfactant self-assembly. And this has been extremely difficult to do and I have to say, Ryong Ryu and his group really did a nice way of solving this in a very elegant way. Now, first of all, maybe to connect to some of the others in the group who have expertise in X-ray diffraction or electron microscopy, I want to show you how we can use these together, like, which is an opportunity that you have here in Sao Carlos, is that what we're going to do is we're going to do X-ray diffraction, silicon NMR spectroscopy, and electron microscopy together, and, and simultaneously as a function of the materials that we can prepare ourselves. So what we do is we look, first of all, we form a hexagonal mesoporous materials. So it's a hexagonal structure. We see it's hexagonal from the high, the wide angle, excuse me, the small angle reflections, which tell us that it's a hexagonal phase after five days, which persists and which is apparently not changing. And if we look at the silicon NMR, this is the very broad MCM41 type structure very broad amorphous glass framework. So this is a broad distribution of sites and it's hexagonally ordered. There's only silica in this material. After seven days, in fact, many people stopped. In fact, it was largely considered that this was the best you could do. And we waited and chose the conditions of synthesis carefully. So at pH of about 10 and 130 degrees Celsius, there's a very small window of conditions where this framework will slowly, on the time scale, uh, longer time scales, transform to a crystalline framework. And I can show you exactly how this happens. This transforms to a crystalline framework as you want, look at the transformation of this very broad spectrum. And at seven days, you start seeing changes happening. The changes, nothing happens from five days. So it's basically stable, at least in terms of the macroscopic and, and X-ray. But now at, at seven days, you start seeing this material starts to give evidence of a narrowing of the distribution of silicon NMR, which is reflecting the onset of crystallization of the framework. Not real crystallization because we don't see any high angle scattering. So it's not real crystallization in a long range three-dimensional three translational order. 
It's actually local, very local order. And this then continues, and after approximately 12 days, two weeks, you see this material on top, which is an amorphous framework, has transformed entirely into a material with very narrow NMR lines, five peaks, one, two, three, four, five sites, which are very, have very well-defined local environments. So this was surprising because no one had seen this before in a way which actually could convert this to that. But there's something else surprising. The surprise is that, in fact, we thought we had converted this to a mesostructured zeolite. But in fact, it's not. We converted it to a mesostructured clay. Because together with this crystallization, what we find is that the wide angle, the small angle scattering here is also transforming, and it changes from a six-coordinate, a six-fold symmetry to layered symmetry. So it becomes a layered material. And so the, the, whether you start off with a mesoporous material or not, the crystallization, up till now, is almost always, we've never found a case where it's not through a layered silicate intermediate. Now maybe it would be interesting to work with someone who does modeling on this, because I think this is somewhat profound in the sense that these are silica nano sheets, highly ordered, one nanometer thick, and form these very localized silicon ion sites, which in this structure, which now are somehow thermodynamically preferred to be in a layered sheet. Now maybe that's not surprising because there's 26 types of phyllosilicates, which are in minerals. Uh, all of them are sheet-like structures, and I think there's no example of a curved surface which would promote a porous structure. So with silicates, at least, you form these layered silicates. Now remember, I want you, I'm going to draw, I mean, we're going to come back to this because this is going to appear in what I'm about to say next. These layered silicates are, there's something special about this type, this particular layered silicate, as I'll show you. But what we also see is why we see some evidence of high angle order, but not enough to make it X-ray uh, indexable. And you can see why. This is a nice uh, electron micrograph from Osamu Terasaki in, uh, in Stockholm, where we did these, you can see the evidence of the layered silicate sheets, but it looks like a drapery. So it's these large curved surfaces because it's mostly surfactant. It's 85% surfactant. And the very thin lines means that this is actually has some very unusual properties of this, which give it the kind of local order, but not the long range crystalline order because these sheets have no common, common uh, registry. Okay, so broad distribution to very well-defined sites, but accompanied by a transformation from a hexagonal phase to a layered phase. So there's some competing thermodynamics, and this explains why it's been difficult. The competing thermodynamics is that you have the energetics of inorganic crystallization. These are very large compared to these weak energetics of the mesophase transitions. This is from Alexandra Navratsky's um, group at the University of California, Davis, who's an, she's an expert on, on the calorimetry of zeolites, glasses, and, and inorganic uh, structures. And what you see here is basically you see this relatively broad, flat, enthalpi enthalpic dependence, which is mainly driven by kinetics, and glass and these open zeolite structures are all very close to each other. So they're all thermodynamically very similar. But the energetics of the enthalpic difference between gl silica glass and zeolites, even though they're similar, is still delta H of about 20 to 200 joules per gram, which when you compare it with the enthalpic differences between small differences in self-assembled mesophases, that is between a hexagonal phase and a lamellar phase, which I just showed, that is going from, from here to here, the, the soft interactions between the van der Waals interactions are very weak, and in fact, one joule per gram. So the energetics of the, of the inorganic crystallization almost always dominate. And this is the reason why it's been hard to control the self-assembly while allowing crystallization to occur, because if crystallization starts, it's a, it, it's a strong thermodynamic driving force to crystallize, and it just ignores the surfactant. And what we've been able to, we're showing is that we're now able to control that. So this is now back to the mesostructured zeolites. Doing it the same way, it's, it's in reverse now. We have, instead of the top, one day at the top, we have one day at the bottom. So now we're working on these mesostructured zeolites. And now what you see, an electron micrograph, so the scale bar is 20 nanometers. You see 
some features of ordered pores, well, at least similar length scales, but basically they manifest only a single reflection in the small angle. So I would say there's some hints here, but disordered hexagonal or just a single kind of pore structure, 